Skin conditions can be notoriously challenging to treat and can cause considerable distress and discomfort to those affected. I'm Amy Skilton, and I believe that clear, healthy skin should be available to everyone. I'm a naturopath, herbalist, nutritionist, and qualified esthetician with 15 years of experience. And one of my areas of specialty is chronic skin disorders. Given the fundamental differences in presentation, etiology, and treatments, you'd be forgiven for thinking common conditions such as eczema, psoriasis, and acne are completely unique. However, there are some key underlying characteristics that unite chronic skin dysfunction. In August, I will be presenting a half-day seminar where you will learn practical guidelines to optimise skin health, and I will be covering ingestible therapies, topical applications, dietary interventions, and how to reprogram the gastrointestinal system to address the underlying issues. Seats are selling quickly, so be sure to book early to avoid disappointment. You can reserve your seat at bioceuticals.com.au slash education slash events. Medicine, and I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Joining me on the line from Christchurch in New Zealand is Lara Bryden, a naturopathic doctor who runs a busy, busy hormone clinic in Sydney, Australia. Now we'll talk about that. But her book, Period Repair Manual, provides treatment solutions for polycystic ovarian syndrome, heavy periods, endometriosis, and many other period problems. And Lara has an incredible blog where she's eloquent in her description of what, what's happening with these women. So welcome, Lara, to FX Medicine. Thank you, Andrew. I'm happy to be here. Now, Lara, right off the bat, I'm going to say to our listeners uh, that we've got more than one podcast lined up because what you do is so intense um, that, you know, it's too much to cover in 40-odd in minutes of, of podcast. So are you okay if we uh, invite you back for another podcast later on? Yes, of course. Wonderful. Yep. So let's get through your background, I think, because it's really interesting. You're living in Christchurch. I am correct, Christchurch, right? Correct. Sunny yep. Christchurch, yep. So take us through <laughs> your, your background as a clinician. Like, Firstly, what drew you to natural medicine and how has this developed in you living in one country and practicing in another? Oh, well, Andrew, that might take the whole 40 minutes, but I don't want to <laughs> bore, bore your listeners with the whole saga, but I'll just say it. My, yeah. <laughs> my, my former work was as a biologist, a wildlife biologist in Canada many years ago, and it was out of that that I came to natural medicine because I just started thinking about the way things work, the way nature works, and how you know that must be the way our body works too, it's a natural system. And so when I discovered naturopathic medicine back in the early 90s, I just dove straight in. So I trained at the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine in Toronto. And then I worked, I just sort of practiced kind of general practice for four or five years in Canada before I moved to Sydney mm -hmm. and started my clinic there in 2002. And I was there for a number of years until I just needed to get to the mountains so then I've moved over to New Zealand and I'm trying to have a yeah a more balanced life and of course Australia has no mountains <laughs> our mountains are, are hills in New Zealand <laughs> And for, and particularly Canada. When I went over to Canada, my, my family got so upset because every turn I was stopping for a postcard picture. I, I just couldn't believe the mountainous regions over there. Admittedly, I, I was only over the west side. But um, um, So uh, can you explain to our listeners a little bit about naturopathic medicine in Canada? Because it's quite different from Australia. It's more intense, correct? Yeah, well, it's a four-year postgraduate program. So I had a Bachelor of Science first, and that's a basically a prerequisite to enter the program. And then it was quite a rigorous curriculum, which, I mean, I know it's rigorous in, in Australian schools too. So I, I don't, you know, I think the difference is maybe from the very beginning of our program where we're thinking about, you know, functioning more as pri primary care practitioners yep. and putting a heavy focus on diagnosis and um, laboratory examination and, and just getting a, you know, a, perhaps sort of a deep sense of, what's going on. And do you have access to pharmaceutical medicines, like some 
um, U.S. naturopathic physicians? Well, yes. I mean, so in um, when I, I did go back and work in Canada for about four or five years ago, and again, and so yes, there in some jurisdictions, naturopathic doctors can prescribe medicines. Um, of course, in my Sydney practice, I don't because no. I operate as a no. as a naturopath in Australia. Yeah. But can I, can you explain yeah. to me at least because it's interested me for some time? What sort of medicines are you allowed to prescribe over there? Um, it's it's almost everything, and depending on the jurisdiction. So what most naturopaths that do there is some of the natural hormones. So it, you know, it's nice to be able to give, for example, thyroid extract or desiccated thyroid, you know, natural progesterone, occasionally antibiotics, things like that. But you know, certainly my style is I wouldn't want to be prescribing many pharmaceutical drugs anyway. That's yeah. why I went into naturopathic medicine. Yeah. So I just want to cover something, and it's more for my interest than anything else. I hope it interests our listeners out there. But you did biology first, and and what interests me is how orthodox physicians, lamb-based natural medicine by saying, you know, it's all placebo, there's no effect, blah, blah, blah. And yet all animals, if if they've got some infection or parasitic infestation, they will seek out certain herbs and plants to intake um, to at least try and control those inv- invaders. And and I think it's ubiquitous in the animal world. Now, an animal doesn't pass on a hint and tip if it's uh, not going to help in their survival. So so what did you learn about biology and, and that sort of um, learning process in animals? So I, I'll, what I'll, sh- I'll share another part of my history, which is that I when I was first practicing in a rural country region in southern Alberta, Canada, I was most of my patients were cattle ranchers, right? And you know, sort of <laughs> very down to earth people, and yeah. they raised animals. And I know a lot of for them, a lot of what we were talking about was intuitive because I would say to them, you know, I think part of what's happening with your health is because of what you're eating, mm. and we need to change this. You know, we need to change what's happening in your gut bacteria, and this, you know, this is 20 years ago. And even though my my medical doctor colleagues at the time kind of thought that was quackery, mm. but anyone who worked with animals knew that that makes sense. Oh, no. Yes, you know, what you eat affects your health, yeah. affects the health of my animals, so I, I can do this. Yeah, we, we can yeah. do a whole podcast on that because it's really interesting what farmers will do to rear up healthy animals and indeed plants. And it's considered normal, yeah. and yet it's considered so alien for humans. I think, are we not animals on this? <laughs> like, is there some disconnect there? <laughs> That's uh, the basic point. That's my answer to your question, is yes, we are animals. Mm. Yes, we so, are. so let's get more into your area of expertise, which you're quite famous for. And you run a successful blog called Lara Bryden's Healthy Hormone Blog. For our listeners, we'll put that link up on fxmedicine.com.au so that they can access that. But what led you to become interested in women's health in the first place as a speciality? I think it's because I'm interested in health Mm. and people and women are more than 50% of people. Mm. (laughs) So it's just kind of, for me, it's just a continuation of I am interested in health generally. A lot of the patients that come to see me are women and it's pretty hard to discuss women's health without really discussing the health of their hormonal system and menstruation because it's so integrated, such a you know key part of our health. Yeah, and indeed, there's a, the, you, I, I used the word disconnect before, and there seems to be a real disconnect. You know, thank you, media, and thank you, these unrealistic expectations of what a woman should be, but there seems to be a real disconnect on how women view their menstrual cycle, um, what it should look and feel like. And in fact, you write about this in your book, The Period Repair Manual. So can you tell us about w- what you see in your practice with how women view a quote-unquote normal period and and the education that you have to go through to, you know, tell them that it's all okay sort of thing or where it needs help? I think you hit it spot on when you said a disconnect. We, we've, we're coming out of a time when we, we sort of think of our periods, our menstrual health as separate from the rest of us, perhaps something you can, you know, just that it only comes up in a gynecologist's office office, or that you manage with the birth control pill and it's kind of a separate issue. But the point I make in my book and really I think the core message of my book is that our periods are the monthly report cards of our health. 
Uh-huh. So if yes. we're if we're ovulating regularly and making hormones regularly and therefore having regular menstruation, that is a sign of vitality. Mm. And that's the way I come at it. It's like it's a clue. If there's something wrong with the period, then there's something wrong with health. So how do you define where there's something wrong when there's such a, a wide variation of normal? So it's actually not that wide of a variation. Um, a period, a menstrual period bleed should come approximately, should arrive approximately every 21 to 35 days. It doesn't have to be exactly 28 days, hmm. but it, you know, it should be in that range. Yeah. Um, it should, there should be an amount of, well, it should, it should then last for about between two to seven days of bleeding. There should be no more than about 80 milliliters of menstrual fluid or blood loss mm. over all the days of the period, which equates, in my book, I help women calculate how much that is. You know, that equates to no more than about 16 filled tampons. And finally, another key element for a normal period, I'll just say it is, because your listeners are naturopaths, so they can agree with me on this, a normal period should be basically symptom-free. It should arrive with no premenstrual syndrome, no irritability, no headaches. It should arrive and it should flow and it should not be painful. And that's the, that's the I'm, I'm raising the bar of what to expect with menstruation, but yeah. that's what we can, most of us can expect. Yeah. So given that, you know, we've got a lifestyle that, that is, you know, just so far away from what, humans evolved from, that we have this industrialized technological era filled with stress and conveniences and all that sort of thing. How different do you find women's period are from that um, that standard? One thing I'll just, I think what needs to be said here is if we really start thinking about ancestral health, which I'm quite interested in and how, you know, how the disconnect, you know, how our, how our ancestors their environment, how, you know, uh, the way that their environment was conducive to their health mm. and how our environment is quite different from that. One thing, we can't really have this conversation about women without acknowledging that our ancestors had a lot fewer periods because they were, they got their periods later in life, they were pregnant or breastfeeding for a lot of the time, so they had fewer periods. So already, the modern woman, as a modern woman, we have a new challenge, which is that we're menstruating. The estimate is probably about 10 times more in our lifetime compared to our ancestors. So we need to find a way, you know, to be healthy with that, to manage that. And, but we, I, I'm unconvinced from what I've seen with my patients that we can do that with the right anti-inflammatory diet, reducing stress, kind of bringing the rest of our environment back to yeah, how it was for eons. But given that we have these daily stresses that we just can't avoid, the rent, the work situations, the family stresses, which, let's face it, women mostly deal with, how do you help women or how do you support women back to um, get having a normal period or having as normal as they can? Um, and it, when I said a wide variation, what I mean is, you know, like some women have leukorrhea as part of their normal cycle. And there's no real issue with leukorrhea uh, unless there's a reason for it. Um, is that correct? Well, if you're talking about discharge, I mean, um, vaginal discharge, I, I think it's important to clarify that women, I mean, there's, there's a normal amount of discharge and there's certainly something called fertile mucus that I think it's important for women to recognize what that is and um, learn to read as one more you know, sign of menstrual health. And in answer to your question about stress and bringing women, you know, helping them reduce their stress, I, I put a heavy emphasis on self-care, reclaiming some self-care, yeah. reclaiming some time for women, for women to spend. I ask them, I have a little very simple prescription that I give out quite often, which is I'd like you to, I say, I say to my patient, I would like you to schedule Two hours per week, which doesn't seem like a lot, but many people struggle to find a way to do mm, that. Mm. Two hours per week that you, that you spend doing something that gives you joy. Yeah, and that could be you know, and not not necessarily exercise or health related, but just reading a novel or going for a little walk or poking around in the shops. Even it doesn't have to be a profound thing. Yeah, 
And yeah, and I, I find that's one way to, as sort of a circuit breaker to help people, you know, bring them back into themselves and a bit of self-care, valuing their, their own time, their own body. Uh, you know, I, I think that is a, a, an issue that it needs to be brought back into everybody. But I think, I think women particularly, like they really do the lion's share of, let's face it, they, these days many women work um, because they have to, to, to support the family lifestyle. Um, and then, of course, we know, studies show, sorry men, that women do most of the housework as well. So there's that incredible stress. And, you know, I think there's a real issue. I, I should be taking a leaf out of this, by the way. Sorry, Lee, <laughs> my wife, <laughs> that that men really yeah. need to help more around the house because women do have these issues with, you know, having time for themselves and, and um, you know, being the caregiver to the children as well. So there's so very little time for themselves. Um, I, I think you're absolutely bang it's, on the money saying that. Yeah, it's good to bring up children because what I hear from a lot of young mothers is they, they they're they're busy. As you say, they're working, they're caring for the home, they're you know they're probably volunteering, they're <laughs> blogging, they're doing everything. Hmm. Plus, they have you know the children that they want to spend more time with, so that then it becomes a situation where if any free amount of time, they then feel, mom, like they you know, should. <laughs> Yeah, they should give that to the kids. <laughs> yeah. But the, the reality is, if you give every spare minute of your spare time to the children, then there's nothing left for yourself. And I think it's better for children actually to see that their mom has, you know, some life that's mm. <laughs> outside of just caring yeah. for them. Yeah, some part of me, if you like. Um, so, getting back to the menstrual cycle, what should women be more alert? Two about blood characteristics, um, you know, like the lamb's fry. I'm sorry to be so blatant about the, the terminology, but but what should women be more alert to with regards to the characteristics of their period? I think actually the most important thing is um, the, the amount, what I said before. It shouldn't be more than about 80 milliliters over all the days of the cycle. And some women have a lot much heavier. Like some women, it's not unusual for women to report up to 500 milliliters of blood loss over all the days of the cycle. So that's a heavy period. Mm. And women might not, if, if that's, because, because we only know what we ourselves experience. So if that's what you've always seen, um, filling super tampons, you know, every hour, and that's just your reality, you might not understand that that's not normal mm. and that there are ways to reduce that. I mean, there shouldn't be, it's normal to see a few clots, Kind of a you know clumped up material, but it's um, they shouldn't be more than about I guess in Australia kind of you know a, a, a ten cent piece um, in size. And I guess the other main thing to say is that you know it shouldn't be painful. And if there is pain, if there is clots, if there is spotting, which is bleeding that happens you know before the real flow starts, all of those can be signs of that. Well, the main sign is that that there may not be enough progesterone, which is a very important hormone that we make in the second half of our cycle and that is very difficult to make actually. So it's it's um yeah, it's it's kind of a very limiting step for a lot of women in terms of period health. Yeah. And and you say it's very difficult to make because it's sort of uh, uh down the track uh and it can be stolen by stress if you like. Yep, absolutely. It's a precursor cortisol so that's one of the reasons it's difficult to hang on to but the the other reason it's difficult to make is that the only way we can make it is with an amazing structure in our ovaries called the corpus luteum which I'm sure many of your listeners know it's a temporary gland that is made at just after ovulation and it grows from almost nothing like cell size to four centimeters in diameter in about a day and it's an Fascinating. It's one of the. It's, it's basically the fastest growing tissue in the body, and we're supposed to do that every month. And you need a lot of, for example, selenium. You need, you know, protein. You need zinc. You need all these nutritional factors to be able to do that. So let's talk a little bit about these nutrients, which we, you know, we used to get in our diet, and we should get in a quote healthy diet, but. How many people have a healthy diet? And, and indeed, how many women go through these issues with periods compared to women that have normal periods? That's a very good question. I don't have a stat for you on that, you know, in terms of how many women are out there I, having I, 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 I reckon you'd be pushed to find a stat. I, I reckon you would be pushed <laughs> to find a statistic of what a normal period is. 
well, of how, or of how many women yeah. experience that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's certainly affected by diet. It's, um, you know, one of the things I tweeted recently was, you know, you cannot fix your period without changing your diet. It's probably the single most powerful way to improve period health is to, for example, remove sugar from the diet, remove inflammatory foods, potentially such as gluten and dairy. I, I do that a lot with my patients. I talk about that in my book. Remove inflammatory vegetable oils. You know, and, and change to more nutrient dense foods, which are whole foods, which is what, of course, naturopaths have been recommending for decades. So tell me about this, about how easy or hard it is, the challenges that you have getting somebody off, a, you know, a lifetime, whatever that has been so far, of poor dietary choices and making those changes towards good, wholesome nutrition. I mean, of course, there are some people out there who can embrace it straight away as soon as they have the information and can feel very empowered, especially once they start to notice results. You know, for other people, so some of my other patients, we go at it a bit more slowly, and I might make one change at a time looking for those results to encourage them to keep going. And it, a lot of it, my discussion around diet with my patients is about trying to kind of reframe this as the new normal. You know, this is you're not on a diet that's separate from kind of the normal diet that everybody else is eating. It's like the problem is the so called normal diet is a big problem yeah. for almost everyone. Yeah. And we just need to start to understand that. Yeah. And uh, I, th I think it's so important for parents to teach their kids about good dietary practices. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's obviously been the convenience and the marketing around, um, you know, these nice quote unquote foods that soothe us um, in times of stress um, that's led us down this path to this high sugar, high processed carb, um, you know, lifestyle. And as you say, why don't we call that a diet and get off it? <laughs> onto what we should yeah. be eating. <laughs> I think a lot about future generations and how they're going to view us and how they're going to look back. And I'm convinced that future generations will see, look back and see the amount of sugar yeah. we eat now as quite similar to how we look back to the people in the 1950s and the way, the way they smoked. Yeah. And we think, oh, that was crazy. <laughs> you know, how could they think that was normal at yeah. the time? It seems so weird to us now. That's what it's going to be like for sugar. Yeah. Absolutely. And I live for that day. <laughs> so why do menstrual issues commonly begin upon menarche? Like are, are kids yeah, that certainly. stressed? Are kids, are kids that unbalanced that they oh. have this sort of set, set up ready to burst, you know, into a lifetime of imbalance? Okay. No, yeah, I'll say I don't think it's the fault of the child or anything, you know, they're doing wrong. It, it, um, it's a challenging time because it's when particularly estrogen, estradiol ramps up for the first time um, around the time of, you know, leading up to the first few periods. And it's a very strong hormone. Oh, it's yeah. a beneficial hormone. I'm a big fan of estrogen actually, but it's strong. And so that's why the body needs a chance to calibrate to that basically to adapt to it. And by calibrate, I mean the estrogen receptors kind of get used to how much estrogen is going to be and, you know, learn how to respond to that. And that can take, you know, well, to be fair, that can take a couple of years, which, but not that you would want to let a girl suffer for that long. But that's why it's that, that early exposure to estrogen is why young, some young girls get um, quite heavy periods. It can be very heavy in those first few years for some young women. And it can be painful. And, they, you know, they start having some premenstrual symptoms. So, for, the, for women that age, girls, it, it really comes back to um, making the changes that, you know, we can by, it comes back to diet again. Honestly, I'll just tell you, I'll just share with your listeners that it, it, those girls respond so well. You just take dairy and sugar out of their diet and give them some magnesium and some zinc. Mm. And there's another, there's a new study, speaking of studies, I'll send you this link. It's a new Australian study, well, fairly new in the last 12 months, showing how powerfully zinc Supplements can yes. reduce period pain in teenagers. And you do that, and you know, maybe, maybe some probiotics because intestinal bacteria affect 
our response to hormones as well. And you do that, and th- these girls are fine. Like, they're, they're my favorite people to treat because they're so, their bodies are so responsive. Yeah. Um, if a girl's in a lot of pain, like severe pain, mental pain, like vomiting and can't go to school, and it can be an early sign of a condition called endometriosis, which is, a, as I say on my blog, I have a, my latest blog post about the condition, I say it's not like other period problems. It's actually kind of in a category of its own. It's really more of an inflammatory disease that can respond to natural treatments, but it does need to be taken quite seriously. And I don't think it's enough to just suppress it with the pill. You know, the, if, if there is indication that there might be endometriosis, then I guess, you know, I think the earlier treatment, the better. So that's you know, perhaps a kind of more unique situation. Yeah. One of the things that that sort of irks me, um, and this is me coming from a standard medical sort of background as a nurse, um, is it, we would never think of splinting a leg if it was broken and leaving that as the treatment. We would always try and fix <laughs> the leg. Why do we always think of just band-aiding these complex hormonal problems with just saying, oh, here's a hormone. It makes us feel good. It it certainly gets rid of symptoms, but it doesn't get rid of the issue. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a real interesting... I think this is what this is what um, engendered me to, um, um, or enamored me to natural medicine. It, it's re- it really starts to address the why did this happen in the first place. Well, I just released a little animation, which you may have seen. You could put this link on your... About yep. why hormonal birth control can never regulate periods. It's not a treatment. It um, completely shuts down, completely suppresses ovarian function, Mm. which is not something we should be doing to a 14-year-old or a 15-year-old, believe me. Mm. But there's no way that that's okay for a young woman to do that. And I think the reason it's become standard treatment is it's just because women's health has been put in the too hard basket. And it's like, well... You know, I don't know. We don't know what to do, so we'll just you know shut it all down and hope for you know. And then plan you know, some future day when this girl's thirty, she can come off and try to have a baby. And that is not working for people. Let's go a little bit deeper into some of the reasons for a shortened or lengthened cycle and the different treatment approaches for each of these. Could you um, t- take our listeners through these, please? Well, the predominant reason for irregular cycles. In women, it affects about between one in ten to possibly one in five women. It's growing in um, in occurrence, in frequency. Is a condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS, which I'm sure many of your listeners, <laughs> you know, are aware of or have patients with that or have it themselves. And the the key feature of that condition is a, a failure to ovulate regularly. Therefore. That can mean either shortened cycles or lengthened cycles because you can have, um, if you don't ovulate, you can have what's called a an anovulatory bleed or just kind of a random kind of shedding of the endometrial lining that occurs too soon um, because it hasn't the body hasn't gone through hasn't made hasn't ovulated hasn't made progesterone to bring the cycle out to a normal length. Now, you know, what really interests me, you said it before, uh, that it's really powerful, particularly with younger women, to give magnesium and zinc. And this has always really interested me because whenever I was treating women and you're doing all of the herbs and putting in the nutrients and things, if you just, and you might be nearly there, but you weren't quite happy with the, with the treatment goal that you had, just adding a really cheap supplement of zinc, B6 and magnesium tended to be that linchpin. And to me, it's all got to do with enzymes. You know what? That's, it's, I laughed because that's often a prescription I'll make for yeah. those three nutrients. That's a, kind of a course. It, and it's, they're <laughs> so cheap. I do. They're I, one of the cheapest <laughs> nutrients. Yeah. Um, I think there's lots of different reasons. I think, yeah, you know, they all support enzyme function. Absolutely. I think you're right. And that's hundreds of enzymes in the body, including those. Look, magnesium is a blog, a post on my blog called The Eight Ways That Magnesium Rescues Hormones. Mm. And it helps to regulate the HPA adrenal axis. It helps to normalize insulin and blood sugar control. It feeds our mitochondria, so it feeds cellular energy, which in terms of women's health is quite important because of going back to the corpus luteum that I mentioned, how in the ovary, how rapidly it grows, that has a huge requirement for cellular energy and mitochondria. So anything 
that supports that potentially can support progesterone and lead to a normal cycle. And I was speaking a minute ago about PCOS. Magnesium mm. is one of my number one supplement, number one treatments for that. Yeah, it's really interesting. Even we we think with um with PCOS, we think. Certainly, if there's a a weight problem with you know a metabolic syndrome, then you need to be looking at weight. But with just polycystic ovarian syndrome or polycystic ovaries, um, magnesium just works wonders. There's some herbs in there as well, yeah. Yes, I mean magnesium is good for almost everything. <laughs> the thing about PCOS, I would like to explain, is that it's not just it, it's a, it's an umbrella diagnosis. So it's a term that's given to women who are actually have that set of symptoms for a variety of different reasons. So this is why, you know, I would I would always hesitate to say, okay, there's one blanket, you know, one thing that always works for PCOS because there's just so many different kinds of PCOS, really. And I, I go into that in my book and on my blog as well. One of the things that, uh, just moving on from the enzymes that I was speaking of before that work so well when you just introduce a little bit of zinc B6 magnesium. Um, I remember that, you know, our old common names were things like, you know, the 21 hydroxylase and the 11 beta hydroxylase and the, you know, there was dehydrogenases in there. And, and what's interesting now is that they're the old names. The current names is they're all sipes. <laughs> they're they're all you know, oh, yeah. sipe 1A2, sipe 11B1, 1B2, you know. <laughs> Okay, so, yeah, the cytochrome system. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And so yeah. so it's it's really interesting how a lot of these nutrients and indeed the herbs that we use, if we think about using like liver herbs, it's almost like scientific, scientifically validated now. It's like that's why we were using liver herbs for these women with, you know, anger and, <laughs> you know, hormonal dysregulation. It was because these enzymes are actually running through the liver and we need to normalize that liver function so critically. So what sort of things do you use? Well, yeah, well, if we speak about liver function and women's health, we're kind of, we're talking about um, estrogen clearance, detoxification mm. through the liver. Um, and I'll just expand that to say that's equally important as the continuation of that estrogen clearance through the bowel yes. and the intestinal, the gut, the microbiome plays a key role in that. So it's not enough to just treat the liver, and I, I would almost never do that, But as in just treat the liver or think about it in isolation like that. But I do use, I guess the one herb I use is um, quite a lot is um, from Chinese medicine called Buplerum, mm -hmm. which helps to, it, it's, it's anti-inflammatory, yeah. as are you know, many of our effective herbal medicines, but it, it does help to promote um, the, the healthy, normal detoxification of estrogen through the liver. And that's why it's been traditionally prescribed for yeah, premenstrual <laughs> hormonal kind of symptoms yeah. and irritability. What I thought was really interesting is, um, and I'm not a TCM practitioner at all, but just glancing um, rather Western arrogantly, I might add, at, um, at traditional Chinese formulations for thyroid is that bupleurum was very often in there as this anti-inflammatory mechanism. I think the player, yeah, its primary benefit is probably its anti-inflammatory effect, and that's important for thyroid because, as you know, most thyroid disease in Australia and the U.S. is autoimmune or inflammatory disease. So the primary natural strategy should be to reduce inflammation, normalize I, function. I think, you know, like you've mentioned a, a, a few topics here that we could delve into in further podcasts, and I think we might do that because each one is really quite intense on its own right, and this is really just an overall, you know, synopsis of, of your expertise and, and how you help people in your in your practice. But what what possible red flags should practitioners and indeed women in general be aware of to say, hey, there's something going on here that we really require further investigation into? Well, clinically, well, certainly the first one that comes to mind is, I mentioned earlier about possible signs of endometriosis. So severe pain. Pain is not supposed to be so severe that, you know, you can't go to school or you can't go to work or you vomit or, you know, kind of normal period pain we can call it normal, would, you know, would be easily recommend, easily um, relieved by a, a nurse or an over-the-counter painkiller. So if that's not the situation, then please explain to the doctor um, the severity of the pain. That's mm. not the main thing. Mm. Um, and the heavy bleeding, the very heavy bleeding. I think it, 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 quantify that for the doctor and explain what's really happening. Um, 
Of course, there are others. I guess I'd say a complete lack of periods, of, you know, not getting periods is certainly something the doctor needs to investigate from many different angles. And don't accept if, if the solution or the prescription is just, oh, here, take this pill and have a pill bleed. Don't accept that because a complete lack of periods can be a sign of PCOS or um, thyroid disease or celiac disease or other conditions or a side effect of medication. Yeah, yeah. what about a high data form mole? <laughs> I mean, it could be something oh, okay. really serious, right. really insidious and serious. Sure, of course. Yeah. Of course, yeah. And, and there are things like um, prolactinomas too, which is quite mm. a common benign tumor of the pituitary that I've seen in clinic many times. And so that would come up as a elevated prolactin, a hormone called prolactin on blood test. And that requires investigation. You know, that requires an MRI and the care of a specialist. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, certainly there are times when um, female symptoms you know, are a sign of something more sinister. Yeah. Um, it, this might be a little bit of a sort of drop into a previous comment that you made, but I remember when you're talking about, you know, a normal period should just come on with no real issues and it should be just a natural cycle that you go through and there shouldn't be these really bad issues of pain. And it twigged a little story in my mind of something many years ago, and, and it's called These Five Ladies. And, and what it was was these five mm. menst- uh, sorry, menopausal ladies or postmenopausal ladies because they'd ceased their periods, and um, they came in to see me for weight loss. And when I looked through these five ladies, and it's a bit of cherry picking, um, symptom picture, I sort of came out that, you know, there was a lot of previous stress and, you know, and that the real issue was their metabolism. And so I gave them some supplements to help with their metabolism. Um, somebody might categorize that as thyroid. I don't like to, but anyway, um, and, uh, what happened is these five ladies started to menstruate again and it was Probably, you know, ostensibly because um, they had had such a bad time with their periods throughout their whole life um, that, you, you know, their, their um, menstrual cycle had basically given up the ghost. Their, their, you know, adrenal glands, if you like, had just given up the ghost and gone fishing. And then w- when we started to nourish them a little bit, they started to menstruate again. What I thought was interesting is these five ladies had such a bad memory of their whole cycle throughout their whole life that they decided to put up with the weight. <laughs> they, they didn't want to menstruate anymore. And I thought it was a little bit sad, mm-hmm. but I thought it was a poignant issue. Or it, To me, it painted a poignant picture of just how long these women put up with problems with their periods without seeking help. It's true. Mm. That's a very good point. That said, we're just, you know, taught to just expect that as part for the course and you know, suffer through it. Yeah, but and, but, but yeah. these five ladies had, throughout their whole life, managed it with pharma- pharmacological medicines. And I, I see real issues with this long-term management with drug therapies that alter female hormones. Do you see many problems with that? I'm trying to decide how strongly worded my answer <laughs> yeah. should be because um, I'll just say um, no expletives. It's not altering. <laughs> yeah, the, the hormonal birth control is not altering female hormones; it's completely shutting them down. Yeah. Hormonal birth control is a form of chemical castration, which you can edit out if you want to later. <laughs> it's a strong word, I know, but it's accurate. Yeah. That's what we're doing to women right now. That's what we're, that's how we're managed. That's how we're, we've treated the last three or four generations of women. And I talked earlier about how future generations will view us. Future generations are going to look back at what we did with hormonal birth control and giving it to healthy women and suppressing, you know, castrating their hormones and not be able to believe it. Wasn't this supposed to be the sexual revolution though for women that, you know, the advent of the pill was supposed to free women? You know, it's a mix. It, when you watch my little animation, you'll see I have a little scene where all the women are cheering yeah. for the legalization of birth control, which, of course, we're all ha- women, birth control should be legal. And this is something we're never going to go backwards in time that way. But there are other methods of birth control, and there are some coming from men as well. Yes. And I'm excited about, you know, so we are smart people, smart human beings. We can invent, we can come up with better methods of contraception than shutting down women's hormones. Mm. So, Lara, you, you, you've taken us through a, just a roundup of, of what you do in your clinic, and I think we'll we'll explore different areas as we move along into other podcasts. But I think 
people need to get a hold of your your book, The Period Repair Manual. So how can they get their hands on it? And indeed, can you recommend any other resources for practitioners where you think that is really good learning? Great question. Okay, well, my book is available on Amazon, Fishpond, iTunes, Kindle, all the usual um, sources. And a couple of other kind of go-to things that I look at. One is... Um, the Australian herbalist, Ruth Tricky, she has a, her latest edition of her book. is called Women, Hormones, and the Menstrual Cycle, and I do refer to that. And um, also there's a Canadian site called the Centre for Menstrual Research and Menstrual Cycle and Ovulation Research, and that's run by an endocrinologist named Dr. Uh, Geraldine Pryor, yep. who is very crude into this as well, and she emphasises the importance of ovulation for women and the importance of progesterone. Great. I think we'll put those websites up on fxmedicine.com.au as well. And certainly, right, Ruth Tricky is my heroine. Um, I say that with an E-N. Um, she's a long-standing <laughs> practitioner. She's a great, great lady too. Lara, I thank you so much for taking us through what you do in your clinic today. And we're going to delve into just exactly what you do in your clinic and indeed your business model in future podcasts. So I thank you so much for joining us today and and we'll look forward to delving further into complex women's uh, issues later in later podcasts. Thanks so much for joining us today on FX Medicine. Thanks so much for having me, Andrew. And I just want to close by saying, you know, and, and appealing to all of your listeners, naturopaths and patients, women, that this is possible for most women. You know, it, it, it's not rocket science. It is possible to have a healthy, regular period. This is FX Medicine and I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. This podcast was proudly brought to you by the Bioceutical Seminar Series, The Gut Skin Axis. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today on FX Medicine, Please engage with us and let us know what further topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in contact with us through our website, fxmedicine.com.au, or look for FX Medicine in your favourite social media platform. You can also rate and review us on iTunes, and we'd really like to thank those who have already rated us. It's through your continued support that enables us to bring you current, complex and relevant topics to enhance your practice of natural medicine.